So this morning's passage of scripture is a really challenging one. And uh, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I would venture to guess that as you were listening to Chuck read it this morning, that it might have made you feel just a bit uncomfortable. That uh, they, you're like, ah, this is not going to be a, a happy, warm, and fuzzy unicorns and rainbow message this morning. I promise not to beat you up too much. I promise not to beat myself up too much. But they instill in us the message of hope that Jesus wants us to deal with. Because overarching this entire passage of scripture, Jesus wants us to wrestle with the question of who he is. I mean, the crowd has some opinions, the Pharisees have another opinion, but Jesus wants us to answer the question for ourselves, who is Jesus? Because the implications for us, depending on how we answer, are life-changing. And the ramifications of those choices could impact eternity. And so this is the passage that we're going to tackle this morning. Now, so let's dive in, starting with verse 14. So in verse 14, Luke tells us just right out of the gate that there's a man in the crowd who's deaf, or I'm sorry, he's mute, can't speak, and Jesus heals him. Then in verse 15, Luke tells us that there are a number of people in the crowd who are just absolutely amazed and what Jesus has just done. Luke verse 16 tells us, but there are some who are not so amazed, and they ask Jesus to prove it. They ask Jesus for yet another sign to prove that he really is who he says he is, that he really is the Son of God. They need just a little more evidence. I want to pause there and remind you at this point in chapter 11 of Luke, I want to remind you of all the evidence that Jesus has provided. Dead people are now living. Blind people see. People who couldn't walk now walk. Deaf people hear. Mute people speak. The hungry have been fed. 5,000 people at one time have been fed. Jesus has walked on water. And so the question to be asked, why one more sign? Why one more miracle? What is it that was just going to set it over the top? You know, like Jesus, I couldn't believe you really are the Son of God when, when that mute person began to speak. And, and I wasn't convinced when that blind person could see. And, and I, even that dead son that you raised for that widow in name, I, I still wasn't convinced. But if you could just do one more, one more, one more miracle, one more sign, then that would be enough to convince me. No, it wouldn't. <laughs> I mean, if you're going to be a skeptic, you're going to be a skeptic. I mean, how much evidence does Jesus have to give? And so verse 17, in verse 17, it tells us that Jesus knows what they're thinking. And he points out the absurdity of it all. It says in verse 17 that they accuse Jesus of performing this miracle by the power of Satan. Now, uh, in the passage of scripture that Chuck read to you, uh, that particular translation used the word Beelzebub. And maybe if you were following along in your Bible, it uh, had the word Satan or it had Beelzebub. The two names are interchangeable. But essentially what is going on here is that the Pharisees are claiming that Jesus has performed this miraculous power by the power of Satan. And Jesus, I'm sure, shook his head. I mean, i got to believe that he stood there and just shook his head like, what? This, 
doesn't make any sense. And so in verse 17 and 18, Jesus goes out to, on to point the absurdity of this. Why would Satan drive out his own evil forces that already possess this man? That kind of behavior isn't logical. It doesn't make sense. And so if Jesus is from Satan, why would he work against Satan? You see, their question is, really, who is Jesus? Well, one way to answer that question of who is Jesus is to look at his motivation. Up to this point, Jesus has only taught that the kingdom of God is near, and that Jesus is the Son of God. He has uh, healed people, he's fed people, he's preached good news to the poor and rich alike, he's fed the hungry, he's gathered the nobodies and told them that they're somebodies. Where in all of that can you find evil intent? Where in all of that work that Jesus has done can you find an example of Satan's handiwork? Well, the answer is you can't. There is no evidence of evil intent or motivation on Jesus' part. And so their accusation of Jesus is absolutely absurd. Jesus, then in verse 19 and 20, asks or, or points out to the religious leaders that one, yet one more huge hole or flaw in their theory. Jesus points out in verse 19 and 20, he said, Hey, you religious leaders, you Pharisees, you have people that cast demons out of other people, out of people who are possessed. By whose power do they cast out demons? It makes no logical sense that our folks cast out demons by God's power, but Jesus is casting out demons by Satan's power. It's not logical. It's absurd to think that way. And Jesus says, if if I'm casting demons out by Satan's power, then your people must be as well. I'm going to let them judge your argument here. I'm going to let them be the judges of what you have to say. Now, Jesus wants absolutely for the crowd and for the Pharisees and for everybody listening, even down through the centuries, to Oh, to come to the conclusion that he isn't working by some evil intent or manipulated purpose or Satan, but that he is the Son of God who has our best interests at the center most of his heart. Jesus wants us absolutely to deal with the question, who do we say that he is? And this is the same question that he asked his disciples before the mount, the, the mount of figure, the mountain of transfiguration. He asked his disciples, "Who do you say that I am?" Well, in verse twenty-one and twenty-two, Jesus launches into a practical application, another way of asking the same question: "Who do you think that I am?" But Jesus now phrases it in terms of an issue of trust. He introduces us to two men. We're going to call the first man George. Now George is a strong man, and George trusts in his strength to protect his stuff, to protect his home and his possessions. And George has gone the extra step of obtaining armor. And so George now has placed his trust in him, his own strength and in the added strength of the armor to protect what he has, to protect his. And then Jesus tells us that Bill comes along, the second man. And Bill is bigger and stronger and badder than George. And he takes, beats George up and takes all of George's stuff. 
Now, the, the implication or the, the practical application that Jesus wants us to draw here is simply this. Our trust placed anywhere, in anything or in anyone other than God, is misplaced trust. George trusted in his strength and in his armor, but that only lasted until Bill came along. And you know that this is true. All I have to do is provide just a few examples. If you trust in your checkbook, how long does it take until your checkbook fails you? Because there aren't enough funds. If you place your trust in the stock market, how long until the stock market drops and fails you? If you place your trust in your retirement, your 401k, that after the tank market or the, the stock market tanks now looks like a 201k. If you place your trust in the government, how long till one of its politicians turns out to be corrupt and fails you? If you trust in yourself, how long till you let yourself down? Because you will at some point. Now, the purpose of all this is, is not to depress you, but the purpose uh, is to point out the truth that Jesus is teaching here, that trust in anything or anyone other than God is misplaced trust. There's always going to be someone bigger, badder, better, more powerful, richer, but no one is bigger than God. And so placing our trust in anything or anyone other than God is misplaced, misguided, and ultimately will result in failure. And the Bible is clear throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament that our God wants us to trust in Him and Him alone. For He will never leave us nor forsake us. Now that brings us to verse 23. And that, <clears throat> that conclusion from 21 and 22, that trust in anything or anyone other than God is misplaced, absolutely informs our understanding of verse 23. <clears throat> because in verse 23, Jesus says, if you're not for me, you're against me. If you're not with me, then you're here to scatter. If you are with me, then you're here to gather. Now, at first glance, this sounds a lot like the argument of that we hear in our world today. Our world today lifts up lots of causes and positions and, <clears throat> and says that if you don't fully embrace my cause or my position or my thinking or my way of life, then you're against me and you hate me and you're evil and you're bad and you're racist and you're sexist and you're all kinds of isists. Let me just name a few of these. I'm not naming them because I think they're bad. I'm definitely not naming them because I think they're good. I'm just giving you some examples of this type of thinking. Black Lives Matter. Roe versus Wade. Pro-life, pro-choice, racism, sexism, gay, homosexual, trans, bi, pan. And if you don't fully embrace and agree with me and my position, then you're against me and you hate me. And it sounds a lot like what Jesus just said in verse 23. But there's a huge difference. And allow me to point out that difference. You see, verse 23 can't be taken out of context of verse 21 and 22, where Jesus just taught us about trust. And that if we place our trust anywhere or in anything other than God, it's misplaced and it will fail us. 
The same is true in how we define ourselves and in the positions and the stances and the causes that we embrace. When we take on a position or a stance or a cause, those will ultimately fail us. And those definitions only serve to scatter. Because those definitions and those positions and those stances all absolutely will cause someone to disagree with you. But here's the difference. Because Jesus has already defined you. Jesus has already given you an identity. You, every single one of you, are a chosen child of the Most High King. You are a precious son or daughter of God's own making and of God's own choosing. You're not a nobody. You are a somebody to God. And more importantly, most importantly, you are someone worthy of dying for so that you might be saved. That kind of definition gathers. It doesn't scatter. And so if you place your trust in Jesus, and you trust in Jesus alone, all these other definitions and identities and causes, they all pale in comparison to Jesus. All those other definitions that other people want to live by, in and out, for or against, they all serve to scatter people into camps and positions and stances. And yet Jesus came to do the exact opposite, to gather us into God's family and tell us that we belong. Not only that we belong, but that we are somebody and that our ultimate identity is found in Christ alone. Anytime we choose to define ourselves as anything other than a child of God, we will come up short. We come up lacking that definition that we've used other than child of God will fail us. Now, maybe not here, but in one of the three churches this morning, someone's going to take what I just said and they're going to twist it around and say, Pastor Don said he hates gays. Or Pastor Don said he's in favor of Black Lives Matter. I didn't say any of that. What I said is, is that any position in, in which you take or any person or stance or cause that you place your trust in other than Jesus Christ will come up short and will fail you at some point. That is the truth. This is what it means to be a real disciple. A real disciple means that you are going to meet people where they are at. A real disciple is going to love you in the name of Jesus. A real disciple, a real follower of Jesus is going to help you find your true identity in Christ. A real disciple is going to point out, point you to trusting in Jesus above all else. And here's the other truth. A real disciple is, is going to do that. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to fall short. We're going to fail in following our Savior because we're not the Savior. Jesus alone is the Savior. 
But we have to constantly remind ourselves to place our trust in Him and in Him alone. We constantly have to remind ourselves to represent Him and Him alone. We constantly have to remember that nothing has precedent in our lives other than serving Him. Real disciples are going to gather. Well, in verse 24, 25, and 26, Jesus gives us yet one more analogy. And the analogy is that of a person who has had a demon cast out, and that demon uh, decides to come back to fill that empty hole in that person, and now their condition is worse off. This is an analogy that... Oh, is best understood, I think, by understanding that we have a God-sized hole in our hearts and in our souls that only God can fill. And yet, as human beings, we listen to the voice of the enemy that encourages us and tempts us and tells us, lies to us, that that hole can be filled by, and then the blank is filled in. And lots of people have tried to fill that God-sized hole in their lives with anything other than what will fit that hole, which is God. I mean, you all know people who have dealt with alcohol addiction. People who have dealt with sex addic addictions. People who've tried to fill that God-sized hole with drugs and causes and identities and education and work and other people. But nothing ever fits quite right. Nothing ever quite fills in the gaps. And this truth, this analogy that Jesus teaches in verse 24, 25, and 26 should sound familiar to verse 21, 22, and 23, where God asks us the trust question. Who do you trust? Where do you place your trust? You see, the enemy who is seeking to fill those gaps in your God-sized hole wants you, ultimately, to choose Something other than God and reject that God is the answer to your God-sized hole. Because that's what he did. The enemy rejected God as God and God had to cast him out of heaven. And so he wants to convince us of that same conclusion that he came to and have and resulted the same fate that he is determined to by lying to us that we can place our trusts in something or someone else. And yet Jesus only came to tell us the truth and show us the way and give to us eternal life. You all know somebody who has traded one focus or one definition or one identity or one cause or one addiction or one job or one priority for another one. And then another one. And then another one. And still yet another one. And they still aren't any better off. And that is exactly what verse 26 is talking about. Well, that brings us to the conclusion of verse 27 and 28. Jesus is teaching, and maybe he's not even done teaching. Maybe he's interrupted by this woman. We don't know for sure. But a woman cries out from the crowd. She cries out, blessed is the woman who gave birth to you and who nursed you. It's a little weird. I mean, imagine you're sitting at commencement for your grandchild. 
And as the commencement speaker is, is winding down, somebody from the crowd shouts out, Blessed is the woman who breastfed you! What? Why? Now, don't hear what I'm not saying, and I'm not against breastfeeding, okay? <laughs> but by today's standards, it's a little strange what, what this woman does. And there's something going on here that we're supposed to take note of. When we talk about identities and how we view ourselves and how we define ourselves and where we place our trust and we gain our value from, how many of you have ever defined yourself as a mother, as a father, as a grandparent? And that role took on all kinds of crazy importance in your life. And Jesus wants you to know that, sure, Mary was special. His mother was special. But Jesus says, blessed rather are the people who do what? Hear the word of God and obey the word of God. That even above your role as a parent, your identity as a parent, above that is the role of being a child of God who hears the voice of their heavenly father and responds with joy and obedience. And verse 27 and 28 should sound really familiar to you because if you could rewind, I know we're in chapter 11, but if you could rewind in your minds back to chapter 8, Jesus says this exact same thing. Jesus is teaching a crowd of people, and he's interrupted, his teaching is interrupted by someone in the crowd who says, Hey, Jesus, your mother and brothers are outside, and they want to see you. And the crowd absolutely expects that Jesus is going to show deference to his mother and father. The crowd absolutely would accept and understand and expects that Jesus thinks his mother and brothers are more valuable to him than they, the crowd, are. And what does Jesus say to that person? He says, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God. And obey. Do you see what's happening there? <laughs> I mean, Luke absolutely, when he records for us what Jesus says here, wants us to think back to that incident and be reminded yet again that there is nothing more important. Nothing. Just like the, the message of Mary and Martha, there is nothing else needed but Jesus. There's nothing more important than Jesus. Because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and the way that we come into a relationship, into a saving relationship with God the Father. Well, we've covered a lot of ground this morning, dealing with some very difficult questions. But here's the one thing that I want you to walk away with this morning. Jesus has no agenda, no cause, no stance for you to take other than what is in your best interest. And that best interest is a relationship with his heavenly father. Jesus wants you to know this morning beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are a precious child of God. And any other definition, any other identity, any other place in which you place your trust is a lesser definition, a lesser identity, and a place of trust that will fail you. It will not fill the God-sized hole in your life. And ultimately, it will scatter you. And so as you come to the communion table this morning, I want, you to be, I want you to be reminded of the great example of love that Jesus showed us by going to the cross, by suffering what he did, 
so that we might be gathered into his family. That our sins would no longer be held against us, but that we would be precious sons and daughters of a heavenly father that loves us and that we're so valuable to him that he was willing to sacrifice himself in this way so that we might be gathered into his family. Let's pray.